So in this final lecture on economic sociology, I want to talk about the social construction of the economy, as well as some patterns of inequality, some of which I've spoken about before in economic, uh, in the stratification lectures, but I kind of want to double down on or, or, or provide more emphasis on today. So a social construction is true in part because we agree that it is. Um, and, you know, often people think about social constructions as things that aren't real, um, but I want to emphasize that just because social, something is socially constructed doesn't mean it's not real. In fact, things that are socially constructed are deeply real and are like, very, very likely to have an enormous reality. And I'll talk about money as a social construction in a little bit. But an example of a social construction would be a checkerboard. And you know, a checkerboard is just a board with squares on it, and it only becomes checkers when we all agree upon the rules. And a checkerboard can also be a chessboard which has different pieces and different rules that becomes a chessboard when we all agree then upon the rules of what different pieces can do. And at some point in time, if we don't agree on the rules of what's happening, we're no longer playing checkers or we're no longer playing chess. And social construction is a core idea in sociology that you've heard me speak about again and again and again. And here, I want us to think about how the economy is socially constructed, or how it's embedded in other institutions of social life, and how it's subject to a series of organizational institutional dynamics, and how we can in some ways get locked into certain experiences of the economy. Um, and that the economy as a set of structures, institutions, and organizations produce logics of action for us, which we then enact in order to reproduce the economy. So if you go back to the very first lectures that I gave, you can think about what are the structures and organizational dimensions that make us likely to act in a particular way, and then how do our actions help reconstruct the economy in that way. Now, maybe one of the simplest social constructions to see is money. So what is money? Um, money is a system of credit. Um, and um, modern economies have a system of credit where we all keep track of value, um, uh, uh, different forms of credit within our societies. Um, in ancient societies, monetary units were often based on commodities like gold and silver, but now it's purely a convention called fiat money. And even um, um, a commodity money like gold or silver was really kind of a convention. Um, the inherent value of gold is not inherent to the value of gold. It's actually deeply limited by how much gold we choose to mine. And if we choose to mine more gold, gold will be more valuable. And actually, when we look at the value of gold today, one of the things that we see is that it fluctuates. So like any other commodity, gold doesn't have an inherent value. It has a kind of value that's like um, uh, tied to a range of other things. But most people don't realize just how much money is a pure convention. So what do I mean by this? Well, money is really just trust backed by force. And, um, you know, if I give you a, a dollar right now, all I'm giving you is a piece of paper. I'm not really giving you anything of value, except that it has a value. You can go to a market and give it to somebody else, and it has a value. And this, you know, if you just start to think about it, like a little bit, you sit, you quickly realize like, wow, like most of the things that I think of as having an inherent, like having value are just conventions. They, are, they have value by fiat. And so fiat or fiat money is just a convention that we use to signify value overall. And so, um, this, um, when we look at the distribution of goods in a society and their tie to money and the monetary supply, what we see is the set of assumptions that we all make about its value tied to a series of social constructions. Let me try and be a little less vague about this. Um, banks don't have the amount of money that they have in deposit. So, there actually isn't as much money, paper currency, or other sets of things circulating in the world as exists. 
for good reason. I mean, you know, there's, 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 there's like, you know, if you really want to get into this kind of monetary policy, I would encourage you to take a class in economics, not in sociology, um, uh, to help kind of discuss these dimensions. But for very good reasons, there isn't that much money circulating. But it might make you ask, like, where is that money if it doesn't actually physically exist? So, you know, if you have a certain amount of money in the bank, and I have a certain amount of money in the bank, and all of the bank's customers have a certain amount of money in the bank, but the bank doesn't actually have that much money. Like it doesn't actually have the money. Where is the money? And the answer is that it's a convention. It's literally something that we collectively agree upon in terms of its existence in order to facilitate future exchanges. When I said that money is really trust backed by force, it's trust that we all continue to agree upon the convention of money backed by force, meaning in the last instance, usually the state guarantees the existence of that money. But to be clear, it doesn't really exist. Like it doesn't exist out there other than on balance sheets and on our shared assumption of its own existence. And so this doesn't make it imaginary. It doesn't make it not real. It's actually very real particularly in its consequences. What it makes it is a social construction, that there are sets of institutions, organizations that produce a particular logic and way of acting that help us sort of navigate and make sense of a context where we just all kind of agree that a dollar is a dollar and that it's totally fine, that you don't actually have control over the dollars that you own, and that there aren't actually as many dollars out there as everybody owns. You know, there's only a fraction of them and that that's okay. Like, that's basically where we are. And instead of thinking about this as a problem, we should actually think about it as highly productive because one of the things that it does is it allows us to all assume the existence of a future. And what I mean by assume the existence of a future is that like, um, Trust as a building block of society is so essential because it allows us to anticipate that there is going to be a future state of affairs with the people. And so I don't need everything that I have right now. I can actually trust that it will exist later on. And this dimension of an economy is incredibly important, but it also points to just how embedded the economy is in a wider range of social relations based on trust in government, trust in other kinds of institutions, and trust in one another. Now, um, the final thing I want to talk about relative to the economy is just how unequal the economy is. Um, and, you know, there was sort of an economic collapse that happened in 2008, 2009, 2010, and then in 2011, there was a major social protest movement called Occupy Wall Street, where participants protested patterns of inequality, and in particular, they protested um, uh, the ways in which a small portion of people seemed to have all the things. And one of the chan chants that they typically used was, we are the 99%. And this constructed an opposition between the 99% of the world and the 1% of the world, or in this case, the 99% of America and the 1% of America, where the 99% were effectively arguing that they were being cheated out of the gains, the income gains and the opportunities of the broader society because a small group of people owned a huge amount of the wealth. And today we see in extreme economic inequality in our markets. And some of this is a product of market design, but a lot of it is also a product of public policy. And so when you see inequalities, one thing to do is to look at markets, but the other thing to do is to look at those other two critical institutions for the distribution of goods, the state and the family. So how likely is it that families can transfer wealth from one generation to the other or invest their current wealth in future generations to generate more inequality. That's something that families can do. 
And then what is it the governments are doing in order to tax people or to distribute opportunities to people that may generate large scale inequalities or that may moderate those inequalities to make them less severe? Markets are not the only places that produce inequalities. States and families do as well. Today, there is absolutely massive, massive inequalities where the top 1% own much more than the bottom 20 or 30%. And um, what the protest movements about this were was basically arguing against corruption. The argument was, was that there was a cabal-like agreement between economic elites and government officials so that two of the bodies that were supposed to be responsible for the distribution of goods in a society, the market and the state, were colluding with one another to advantage one small group of people rather than everyone. So that they were working really hard to make sure that rich people stayed rich and they weren't really working very hard for other groups. And so one of the questions becomes, how much capture is there by political elites of the economy and by the economy of political elites? Or another way of thinking about that is like how tightly tied together are political elites and economic elites such that the two places that should be responsible for the distribution of goods in society, states and markets, actually work together to advance the interests of only one group, already dominant. And this is a critical question of, of asking about the interrelationship between the different sources of distribution, families, the state, and the economy, and what the consequences of them being aligned are. Now today, what does it mean to be in the top 1% of the United States? In recent years, it means that you make about $340,000 a year per individual. For families, it's a little bit more than this includes some professionals like surgeons and top lawyers, definitely financial professionals like fund managers and people who can make short-term profit. Very few people are always in the top 1%. Um, some people, you know, uh, high wage earners are, but most 1% one, one are in that category for a shorter period of time. They like a lot of money for a few years and then they drop out of the 1%. So they like, make a ton of money, and then they move to be not making as much money, they may then rely upon wealth. So professional athletes are a good example of this. You know, um, uh, Michael Jordan makes a lot from owning things now, but he doesn't make a lot from working. Like, so he owns the rights to a bunch of things that give him things, but he doesn't actually work. I mean, he probably does work, to be honest, but like he, he doesn't work in the way that he worked before. So a lot of professional athletes will have a lot of earnings, and they'll turn that earnings into wealth, things that they own, and then they live off the wealth for the rest of the years. So they make a lot of money for a few years and then have more normal income levels in retirement, or um, they have higher income levels off the wealth that they produced. Studies of tax records show considerable changes in wealth over time. In the 1880s, the wealthy tended to be landowners who leased their lands to families and businesses. And this is classic for most agrarian economies, that if you look at a highly agricultural economy, so this would be India until kind of recently, um, Spain actually still has a high degree of uh, agricultural wealth, somewhat curiously, um, uh, China until the 1970s, this was basically the structure of the Chinese economy was one where the very wealthy tended to be landowners and generally leased their lands to families or businesses. And the Maoist revolution was in part a challenging of this structural organization, but still land ownership as a form of wealth was somewhat important. That's changed considerably recently. Today, we don't see that landowning is essential to the being very wealthy or to having very high incomes. Instead, they're much more likely to be found in banking and finance and basically businesses that manage money. And so the management of money has become one of the central places or reasons why it is that people are part of the extremely wealthy. And so, you know, people, when people innovate, that is they create, generate new forms of banking, they generate new kinds of wealth. And so, you know, the wealthiest companies in the 1990s 
1900s, like Standard Oil, don't even exist anymore. And the wealthiest firms today, they're basically in Silicon Valley, um, and some of them in Wall Street, are absolutely But what this points to overall is a financialization of the, of the economy. And so in the past, wealth came primarily from land ownership and from making things. And today, wealth comes increasingly from collecting and managing money. And we call this the financialization of the economy. Now, I've given you an example of this before, and I'm just going to repeat it in this lecture because it might be helpful for you to see what the financialization of the economy means. If you walk into a clothing store, one of the things that they often will do when you go to check it out is to ask you if you'd like to apply for a credit card. And the reason that they're asking you to apply for a credit card is because they're going to charge you a lot of interest on that credit card, and that's how they're going to make money. If you walk into a car dealership today, one of the things that they will ask you is that if you'd like to finance your car with the car dealership. The reason that they're asking you to do that is through the financialization of the car. That is basically by giving you a loan, they're going to charge you interest, and they're going to make money off that interest. You also may not make a payment, and then they can actually increase the interest, or you default on the loan, and they can reseize the asset, which is another way in which they might be able to make some money. It's not ideal for them, actually, but it is an opportunity. What this means is that, like, clothing stores now don't necessarily sell clothes. They also sell financing. Car companies don't just sell cars. They sell financing. And this is part of a broader trend of the financialization of the economy, where making more money often means collecting and managing money. So General Motors Auto Company, GMAC, is really no longer a car company. It's kind of a car company, but it's also deeply a financing company. It's a company that makes cars in order to sell you financing. Several clothing companies do something similar. They make clothes in part to sell you financing. So that the economy has pivoted a bit from wealth coming from the making of things to wealth coming from the financing of the things that are being made or the financialization of the economy or the idea that wealth and profit come from in part collecting and managing money. It's an interesting transformation. And you know, you shouldn't take it too far. It's not hugely, I mean, it's 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 partially, um, uh, it's certainly true, and it's driving some of the profits. It's not driving all of the profits of General Motors or all of the profits of the gap. But it might help you see how the economy has pivoted from the making of things and the management of land to the management of money, and that that has become increasingly a very important asset. Now, finally, I want us to think about political economy that talks about sort of the relationship um, between um, uh, um, different modes of managing the economy. And uh, political economy, you know, there are kind of two major approaches to political economy, which is the broader study of the economy and some of its implications. Um, the first is a market-centered approach, which we associate with Adam Smith and the invisible hand, and the other is a critical approach which we would associate with Marx. And I've decided to teach it this way, to bring this at the end rather than the beginning of the lecture, to kind of pull together certain sets of themes. Smith was optimistic about markets and basically said markets were going to generally increase the overall wealth of nations. And um, he thought that like, rather than have a visible hand that physically actively guided the economy, it was better to allow the economy to simply function on its own, and that the decentralization of exchange was something incredibly positive, that if people wanted something, they could pay for it, and so therefore this invisible hand of desire guides production, not management by the part of the state. He didn't argue that markets were perfect, so instead the pursuit of profits motivates us to be useful to other people. Insofar as I want profit, I don't want to be generous to other people. I want to be useful to them. And, you know, like, like you can ask yourself, like, how many doctors would leave medicine if they still had to train for eight years but 
earned the minimum wage, like very few of them. And so he thinks about the economy as existing within a set of incentives. Um, and that people being useful for one another can create a conditions not of generosity, but of mutual benefit. And so for Smith, the approach to the economy is one where the decentralization of exchange and the realization of people's wants and desires can generate the conditions of mutual benefit. Smith also was concerned about an extreme boredom with the division of labor in the society. By contrast, Karl Marx was deeply critical of the capitalist system. Marx, it's important to note, was writing well after Smith. So Smith was writing sort of at an early time in, in capitalism, and Marx got to see some of the negative consequences. And here we see a picture of Karl Marx um, before we saw a picture of Adam Smith. Um, Marx thought about the ways in which Marx, markets exploited people and that the system would eventually crumble. And so that one of the central features of market economies was a feature of exploitation, how they dominated people, um, in particular made people more and more and more vulnerable so that it could pay them less and less and less. So that the, the dimensions of capital were the de-skilling of workers so that workers could be paid less and that workers would be put into competition with one another and that their lives would become worse and worse and worse. Now, I think, you know, we could ask like which path in light of both the praise and the criticism of this. Sociologists and other social scientists have vigorously debated whether society should move into a direction of more capitalism or to be anti-capitalistic or to transform capitalism. The capitalist direction are those who think that governments need to reduce regulations on businesses and lower taxes, and this would allow firms to be more efficient and for the general wealth to increase. The anti-capitalist critics will say that no, markets actually need considerable regulation because the consequence of not regulating firms is that they're going to generate a lot of negative outcomes that somebody's got to pay for. And these are what economists call externalities. They kind of kick out all these things external to the firm that have huge social costs that the firms themselves aren't responsible for. And so, you know, Marxists have called for governments to take full control of production. Few people are calling for that today. But overall, there tends to be this balance between the state and market and who is how much regulation that there is. And my encouragement to you is that rather than think about them as like, yay, the state is great, or yay, the market is great, one or the other, think about them as both doing something to produce and distribute goods and how it is that they might be balanced with one another. How it is that the different sets of things and skills that markets versus states have in their distributional capacities may be work, work on one another for mutual benefit. So that's where we'll end with economic sociology.